La propera convidada es una dona nascuda a Valencia, investigadora de ICREA, el Instituto Catalá de Recerca. Eh, es una arqueóloga especializada en arte prehistórico de España y de Australia. Bienvenida, Inés Domingo. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Patricia and uh, I, Catalunya, for inviting me to talk about my research here today. And, um, well, I'm an archaeologist, and some people like to call us like the detectives of the past. And as an archaeologist, um, I work at the um, University of Barcelona as a, as a career research professor, and I'm also a member of the Seminario de Estudios y Recerques Prehistóricos. As uh, an archaeologist, I'm especially interested uh, in prehistory and uh, I look for clues in the archaeological record to try to find out how people lived in prehistory, how they communicate with each other, how they interact with the landscape and so forth. And one of the archaeological remains that really called my attention from the very beginning was rock art. Uh, not just because it's fascinating, not just because it's um, the beauty of the art, and I'm sure you all are familiar with um, the polychrome bisons of Altamira. Um, uh, I'm also interested because of all the mysteries uh, hidden inside the panels and also uh, because it's one of the archaeological remains that's been used for uh, by many researchers to um, define what makes us humans uh, because it's uh, one archaeological remain that shows our capacity to communicate through images and through symbolism and also our capacity to have um, and abstract thinking and uh, symbolic behavior. Uh, and last but not least, I'm interested because it's the only images that we have from a past that is completely lost. Uh, it's kind of a photo gallery where we can find out information about this past. And uh, apart from the things that we traditionally explore from the archaeological point of view, such as how art changed through time and space and so forth, there are things like hot topics that can also be explored through the analysis of the art, so, such as, uh, for example, uh, a question that everyone likes to talk about today, uh, which is climatic change. Uh, we can explore how uh, the climate changed in the past through exploring the different kind of animals depicted in the panels. We can also explore things like uh, technological change through time, uh, exploring uh, the tools and the uh, material culture depicted in the panels and so forth. Uh, it's, rock art is very interesting because it's a global phenomenon. We have rock art everywhere in the world. And so I had to focus on a specific uh, area to conduct my research, and I decided to focus on um, the rocker of Mediterranean Spain and uh, one specific rocker tradition called Levantine rock art. Levantine rock art is a tradition um, that was probably created 7,000 years ago. We have more than 1,000 sites in eastern Spain from uh, the Pyrenees to Almeria. And in the panels we find um, amazing scenes with naturalistic humans and animals sharing scenes um, uh, reflecting different aspects of the past such as battles, we have different hunting tactics um, represented, we have ceremonies and we have many aspects of the past that are really of interest. So um, what I do is I try to analyze the panels to get clues about how people were um, living in the past. Uh, I'm also interested in other aspects of the art that I can um, study from uh, purely archaeological research, so I also um, establish relationships with colleagues from other disciplines. I work with physicians, uh, physicists to analyze pigments. I work with uh, surveyors to do 3D models of the art, um, not only for scientific purposes but also um, to, for conservation issues and to share it uh, with the public. I'm interested in the um, heritage values of the art as well and so forth. But there's one, one question that I could never answer from an archaeological point of view, and is the question of meaning. What does the art mean? Can we understand the art of, art of a different culture? 
And so I realized early on in my career that to answer this question, I had to move to a place where rock art is still part of a living culture. And so I decided to move to Australia and start working with uh, colleagues from uh, Flinders University, um, Professor Claire Smith, uh, to explore rock art in a living context in Arnhem Land. And there's many things I um, learned from my experience in, in Australia, but there's one thing that I think is key in our understanding of past um, forms of art, and is that through ethnoarchaeology, working with indigenous people, I learned that what is important is not the art. Um, the art is just a tool, it's just, just a gate gateway to communicate and to, um, and to pass on information about uh, culture, traditions, about the creation time, uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, it is also the key um, to um, educate young generations about, about the culture. And it's also a way to mark places that are significant in themselves. So it, it, the art is not what is important, but the context where it was produced is important. And this is why the same, why the same sites were constantly revisited and uh, repainted uh, to mark the importance of these places. And I think this is one of the key points I learned in Australia, uh, because it made, that, it made me change my way of um, thinking about um, past forms of art. So I'm not just looking at the art uh, anymore, just the depictions, but also the context. Um, and I think that's more or less it. Thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> the timing was just right. Perfect. Six <laughs> Thank minutes. You. So tell us, Ines, how was that you started with your interest in archaeology? How was that? Uh, it was a surprise to me, so I could say, no, I, was, I used to watch Indiana Jones and I fell in love with it, but that's not the case. Um, in fact, I studied um, history because I was interested in becoming a journalist, so very different from archaeology. But f when I was in my first year, I had the chance to um, go to an excavation as a volunteer. And that was it, I just fell in love uh, with archaeology, with the idea of finding things that the last people that touched them uh, was living like a thousand years ago, uh, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. Oh, the mystery. So the, the mystery and the discovery uh, of... And where, where was that? In that was in Valencia. It was an excavation in Caldete de las Fuentes. It was an Iberic site uh, from the Iron Age 700, 000, 700 years ago. So living yes. in the Iberian Peninsula is also a dream place for an archaeologist, I guess, supposed. Yeah, I think so, because we have, uh, we're really fortunate and we have um, archaeological remains that dating back um, 700,000 years ago uh, up until today, because we have reoccupations of, uh, of the Iberian Peninsula over and over uh, th uh, from different cultures, and it's really a place to study archaeology and to So you decided, I would like to become an archaeologist, but from the archaeology field that is open to the prehistoric art, how, how was that shift? That, that was also by chance. So I, I started um, volunteering in excavations from different periods because I really wanted to learn which period I was interested in. And then I had a topic in uh, rock art um, by um, one of my professors, uh, Professor Valentin Villaverde in, in Valencia. And um, I really loved it when I was studying uh, rock art. So from that time, that was I think when I was in third year, I started reading more about rock art and volunteering in activities related to rock art recording and, and so forth. And what is the thing that really attracts you or makes you love this art or the thing that connects you with that kind of art? I think it's some of the things I already mentioned. So it's the beauty and the mystery behind it, but it also the fact that it's really, I like communication. As I said, I like to, uh, before I wanted to be a journalist, so I like communication and I, I'm really impressed about the way of, um, the capacity of humans to communicate through, uh, through art, through images, uh, through symbols, and, all what it and said not just through, through words. Also, it says a lot about our evolution and the cap capacity of the symbolism and yeah. symbolized thing. Yeah, but um, that's, that's complex because for, for a long time people thought that we, we started uh, from very simple depictions to complex ones, but now there's lots of discussions about that and it seems that from the very beginning we had really 
like impressive artwork, so it's not really um, a simple evolution from simple to complex. But also, we already started with very complex representations. That's interesting because also in art, what is complexity? Because modern art had gone back to, to, to the simplicity. Yes, yeah, so so. I think it's, yeah, it's kind of depending on the fashions in each time. So the idea is to be able to communicate through uh, symbols, uh, but then the way you use the symbols to communicate changes with culture. So it, it, it's not only related to time, it's, it's related to culture. The context, but it is tradition. Very, very hard to, to, to find clues about that if we are talking about thousands of years. So how what is the process? What tools or technologies do you use to get to know a little better the context in this? Yeah, in a context uh, like in Spain where we, are, we don't have contact anymore with the people who produce the art, I think um, we can't keep trying to uh, identify the meaning. But there's other things that we can identify. We can identify function by uh, exploring the context where the art was uh, discovered. So uh, if the rocker is linked to uh, burials, we know it's related to death. If the rocker is related to areas where there's human activities, like daily activities, it could be more related to um, education, not necessarily ceremonies. Uh, so depending on the context and the analysis of context will be key in order to try to get information about the potential function of the art. And what have you learned about the people who painted? Who were them in the community? Do we know something about that? Well, it's difficult to know about who were um, the, the authors in the past. Uh, but through ethnoarchaeology, which is what I do in Australia, working with indigenous people, um, you realize that it's not everyone um, paints, so they are trained to paint. They have to, to paint what the tradition says, that is the correct way of painting, the correct um, content of the painting. So maybe because I'm from one um, skin name or, or one clan, I can depict these images. But if I'm from another one, uh, I can only depict those other ones. So um, there's a very complex process about who can depict, uh, who can produce paintings, where can they mm, paint. They can paint in, the, in, in Australia in the places where they come from or their ancestors come from, but not in the lands of uh, and other clans. So it's really well regulated who can paint, where they can paint, what they can paint and so forth. And I, it probably was the same in the past. So, And it's the same in the present. So if we have a church, no, everyone can go there and paint the church. We'll choose the right person to depict the right images in, in the in So they place. were important or uh, people who had this, this specific training and role in the community who were the ones who painted? Yeah. Who they, painted the history of yeah. of their own community. And also, well, in, in the communities, it's very clear that um, the, the, the tradition of, and the knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. And you get the knowledge as you get older. And the elders are the ones who have all the knowledge. They, they don't live in capitalist societies. Uh, so what is important in these indigenous communities is the knowledge. So you have to get the right to know. And you get that um, as the the time um, passes and, and you show interest for uh, knowledge and then you might get, get it and, and become important in the community because you have the knowledge. And also all the pigments and all that to learn how to use that. How, was, how, are, how is that? Uh, what pigments they were used? Well, that's interesting because here everyone uh, always asks where they're using blood. Uh, and uh, no, we have done uh, analysis and we, we've never found um, <laughs> blood as part of the pigments. Um, they use all sorts of natural pigments, but especially um, iron oxides for the reds, uh, black uh, carbon or manganese for the blacks, um, kaolin for the, for the whites. So it's pigments, minerals or, um, that they can find in nature. And they, they mix it with different um, elements. So in archaeology, um, it, it's very rare uh, to find out um, the organic matter that they, they use to mix it. Uh, but uh, through, for example, ethnarchaeology, in Australia they, they used to mix it with uh, this, the juice of an orchid. So there's different natural materials that they can use to produce these pigments. And that's something that they learn through culture too. And, and very complex processes that they have to yeah. learn and pass. Yeah. So the act of painting is not 
it's not something simple. It, they, they, they first have to go and gather the materials they need to produce the art, as um, our colleague that was talking before uh, does, trying to get sand and, and things to produce his art. So that was the same in the past. And, and then the creation process in itself is something that's prepared uh, and, and, and it's very complex. And how you were mentioning how important has been for you to, to go to Australia and to see the communities, living communities of indigenous, to see how the context was important. How it, that experience enriches or connects with what you have been doing in Spain in these very, very old uh, excavations or caves? Well, I, I decided to move to Australia apart from because, uh, because they have um, rock art, also because the indigenous communities living there were um, hunter-gatherers, which is uh, the same economic way of life. We think um, people uh, producing um, the, uh, the prehistoric, most of the prehistoric art in, in Spain uh, were as well, so they were also hunter-gatherers. So I tried to find, to, to compare societies that have uh, same uh, economic uh, levels. Um, but then uh, through my experience in Australia, I learned things about the importance of the landscape for indigenous people, uh, which was probably the same in the past. Uh, we, we now forget about how important is the landscape to survive, but yeah, in, in fact we, we completely depend on it. And, and for indigenous people, for example, um, there's special connections to specific places in the landscape. And these places are powerful because they are linked to the creation time. And this is why in those places they produce the art. So it reminds us, well, it, it made me um, think about the art differently. So I used to focus just on the paintings themselves, uh, on the animals depicted, on the scenes and so forth, and forget about the context. And in fact, I realized through working in Australia that what is important in the landscape and we need to try um, to find out the patterns in the landscape where the rock art is located to try to understand um, how the art was used. So we might not be able to understand the meaning but we can get other information about how people used art in the past. And what is your project, current project or line of research that you are pursuing right now? Well, I have two different projects. I have one in Spain to continue understanding uh, the evolution of um, Levantine rock art in Spain. Uh, and then I, I, we also um, just uh, were granted a, a scholarship in Australia to continue um, studying rock art in a specific area uh, in Arnhem Land. So these are the two projects I have at the moment. And what are the, now you're talking about the aesthetic experience that you have had when you see these things, what do you feel when you discover, when you enter uh, into a cave and find this huge or tiny but very old work of art? What do you feel? I think I could compare that, like I now have um, little kids and I'm really impressed about their, um, faces and their feelings when they open a present in Christmas. And I think for us as archaeologists it's kind of that. So it's kind of discovering something that's been hidden there for ages and, and you're the first person to, to, to discover that. And, and the feeling is amazing. And if it's rock art, it's even more impressive. So sometimes when you see a f um, site for the first time, you can even cry. So I, that's what happened to me in, in Australia. The first rock art site I visit in Australia made me cry, just because it's so impressive, so beautiful, so colorful, full of power. Um, so and well preserved probably because of the... And well preserved cave. because it's a continuous tradition. The last generation painting rock art uh, was just um, 20, 30 years ago. Wow. So it's, it's been a continuing tradition. Uh, now I would like to go to one of these caves to see this. <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> That's a breathtaking um, experience. Thank you very, very much, Ines, for sharing with us your passion for the archaeology and for the art and that is some is very connected to what we were talking before thank you very much <laughs> thank you